Everybody give Smiley a hand as well. Uh, uh, fantastic. So listen, we are, uh, now that we got the, the details sorted there, we're excited. I'm excited for today. Today's Sunday. We're doing this series called Facing Giants. Uh, we've already overcome one giant this morning, which was my audio pack here. So we're, we're doing great there. We're overcoming um, on all fronts. Um, and we're focusing on a story about David and Goliath. And the thing about David and Goliath is this is a story that pretty much all of us know. Wow, full front row. This is amazing here. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Love that. So this is a story that many of us know. It's a story that even if you're not really familiar with church, you haven't been to church a lot, you've probably heard about the story of, of David and Goliath. Uh, you you kind of know about the giant and Goliath being the giant, David being the little guy. In fact, when Benjamin, uh, you know, parents know this at, at, at a young age, your kids listen to these songs and they're made for kids. And when you're in the car, you're listening to them and then you've memorized it and you're singing along to it. And can't wait for them to grow up so that you can stop listening to their music in the car. And there was a song that Benjamin loved. It was about David and Goliath. And it was real kind of like Goliath. Doom, doom. And he just would sing that over and over and over again. So, I mean, it's like um, it's a story that, that's woven into many of us. And what happens when a story gets woven into many of us, especially the way that pastors preach or teach about the story of David and Goliath, is, is there, there ends up being so many different narratives that we put to the story of, of David and Goliath. So there, there are just so many narratives. And these narratives could be something that the... Um, that a pastor or a preacher you know, kind of says, like, like, hey, you can go out and you can defeat your Goliath. You know, whatever the Goliath is in your life, you can be a David and, and you can defeat it. Hey, if, if, if something comes against you that's bigger than you think, all you need is your five little stones and you can overcome this huge giant in your life. What's your Goliath? Is it your finances? Is it your car? Is it whatever, whatever it is? But you can do it. And we've been taught by preachers and teachers for a long time, these different narratives. And what it comes down to at the end of the day is it leaves us with this thought, with this impression, that if, if I just have a little more faith and courage in God, you can do and you can conquer anything. Well, there's something that's not all that great with this statement. Because that leads you to a place of, well, what happens if I feel like I have a lot of faith? What happens if I feel like I have a lot of courage, but I can't seem to conquer this? Is it, I'll even throw this in the works, is it even God's will that you do conquer the Goliath that you're facing? You know, we all know that struggles and strife actually build us and they make us stronger. You know, the strongest tree is the oak tree on the windy side of a mountain because it's forced to have deep roots into the ground. And so is it even God's will that you overcome? God may be doing a work in you. And so what we've done is we've assigned this thing to David and Goliath of if I have a little more faith and courage in God, yes, I can do and I can conquer anything. And I, I think this leaves us a little bit short. And it leaves us sometimes doubting what's wrong with my faith. See, what we end up doing is, is, is there's these, with, with these famous stories that we have, and I'm calling them stories, but these were events, especially David and Goliath. This was an event that was written down. And, and when we look at these, we end up kind of selfishly asking two questions. So we, we ask, okay, well, what about me? And how does this help me? So when we look at the story of David and Goliath, we say, well, what about me? Where am I? Well, obviously, I'm David. Duh. And what, what, how does this help me? Well, obviously, this means that I'm going to overcome this thing that I'm really struggling with. I'm going to overcome this addiction. I'm going to overcome... Uh, this relationship that's toxic in my life. I'm going to overcome a lack of finances. I'm going to overcome fear. I'm going to overcome this, this lack of grace that I feel like I have in my life. But I'm going to overcome because this is going to help me. What about where am I in the story? And how is this going to help me? See, David and Goliath, like many other narratives, and next week we're going to talk about uh, Jonah and the whale, and I'm really excited for that. But we take these from the Old Testament these things, and we, we pull them out, and then we apply them to our lives. And we apply them through these filters. And if you've done this, if you're doing this, you know, the Bible is inspirational. It is meant to inspire. So if you've read something, or you, you've taken something from the Bible like this, and, and it's given you inspiration or courage, like, there's nothing wrong with that. 
that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when we establish and build our faith and our foundation on something that actually was not written for us or for our benefit. See, to give you a contrast, when Paul wrote um, all of the New Testament that he wrote, he wrote it for the church, for the church to continue to read it, for the church to continue to abide by it. But what's different about the story of David and Goliath is, see, in that day and time, tradition was passed down orally. So it would be something that, that uh, you, would, you would tell your grandkids or you would tell your kids about. And then as they grew up, they would tell their kids about it. And these stories, these, these events, they would be passed down generationally. But it was, an oral, it was an oral tradition to do that. It was something that you talked about. That's the way that they were passed down. But something different happened with David and Goliath and some of these other events that we're going to look at. See, the difference in David and Goliath is that someone wrote it down. Someone wrote this down. Now, why, why would a culture and a society let things be passed down orally, and then all of a sudden something happens, and they decide, we need to actually write this down. We need to actually pause and put this down so that we remember it exactly as it's happened. See, if we don't pay attention to why it was written down, then we miss what is trying to say. So what I'm asking us to do this morning is for us to kind of jump out of that normal box of, of narratives that we assign to David and Goliath. I'm asking you to, to kind of take, take your, your, your self out of this story. Don't identify with David. Don't identify with Goliath. Don't identify with Saul. But instead, I want us to try and think around this idea of why was this written down? Why did the nation of Israel decide to write this down? And as we unpack the why did they write it down, we're going to understand what exactly that they were trying to say. See, there was something so significant to this event that it had to be written down in order to preserve its significance. So I want you to understand that our purpose in being here this morning is to uncover and discover a truth about God that applies to us through a significant event that was written down for a purpose and for a reason. See, because this nation, because these people wrote it down, we still benefit from it today. And it may not always point to you being David or you being Goliath, but what it does always point to is something about God and something about God and our relationship with Him. So I'm going to unpack the story for you. I'm going to unpack the actual events of David and Goliath. So if we look at the location, the location of, of, of this event was modern day Palestine. And the players, so we've got two kind of opposing players here. You've got the Israelites and you have the Philistines. And so, modern day Palestine, uh, I'll show you on a map here, and then you have the Israelites and you have the Philistines. Now, this, this is a very complicated thing because there's lines everywhere, but I'm going to kind of focus you in here if you can see it. Here we have an island called Crete, and out of the island of, of Crete is where they suspect that the Philistines came from, and they were a seafaring people. I mean, they had to be because they lived on an island. They either had to get comfortable with the ocean or they were going to stay on that island. So all these little blue lines are lines where they left from Crete and tried to conquer and take land and areas um, around them. And the one that we're going to be focusing on is this little blue line here that brings us to modern day Palestine. So I've got another map for you here. So if you were to Google map this back in the, the... if, if the Philistines had Google Maps, this is probably what, what it would come up with and tell them. But here's the Isle of Crete, and they're going to land right here next to Israel, just south of Jerusalem. And they're looking for a strategic place called the Valley of Allah. And the Valley of Allah was really important to them because this valley was below Jerusalem. So they could land, go inland... Take the valley of Elah, and I mean like through war. Take this valley, and then they could travel north up to Jerusalem. And when they got to Jerusalem, they actually, because of the way that it positioned them, they actually would divide the city in half. And when they divided the city in half, then it's divide and conquer. 
And so there was a lot of strategy for why they wanted to land here in this valley and, and why they wanted to use this as their road to Jerusalem. So let's look at what the Bible says about it. This is 1 Samuel verses 1 through 3, and, and this is the account that we have. This is the account that the Israelites wrote down. So they said, the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. So they've, they've been on the boat, they've landed, they gathered their armies for battle, and they were assembled at Soko. That's how I'm going to pronounce it. Sorry for our, our Bible scholars in here. Which belongs to Judah, and they camp between Soko and Ezekah, and another word that I can't say. I'm afraid that I'll cuss if I try and say this word <laughs> here. I'm glad you guys are, are with me there. So essentially what you need to know is that, is that the Philistines have landed, and they're heading. They're heading to where they, they think that they want to go. And they've decided to kind of make camp. And then in verse 2 it says this. It says, Saul, so Saul who's representing Israel, is the king of Israel, and the men of Israel were gathered together, and they camped in the valley of Elah. So here we have that valley. These two parties are, are coming together. And he assembled in battle formation to meet the Philistines. Things are starting to get exciting. The Philistines and the Israelites are coming for battle. And that's pretty cool. And then in verse 3, it, it finishes with the Philistines were standing. Okay, so, so this is, we all know the story. But this is so crazy how strategic that this was. The Philistines were standing on the mountain on one side. And Israel was standing on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them, the valley of Allah between them. Now, I've got one more picture for you that I'll show you to kind of really put it into perspective for you. John, there you go. So, th this is the actual valley today. Obviously, they didn't have a highway running through it. Um, otherwise, things would have probably been a bit different. But here's the actual valley. Valley of Allah runs right through the middle. On one side, on a mountain, you've got Israel's camp. And on the other side, on a mountain, you've got the Philistines' camp. Now, what would happen is because Israel's camped on a mountain, and because the Philistines are camped on a mountain, and because the valley is down below, neither army wanted to go down into the valley. Because if they went down into that valley, they would lose their, their strategic position, and the other camp would have an easier opportunity to attack them. And so what happened is these two military powers, these two forces, they came together and it was a deadlock. Because neither one of them wanted to take a chance in, in risking their army or risking losing. And so they, they've got this, this, this deadlock between the two of them. And so that's why you have one on one side and one on the other side. See, when we read this story in the Bible, I don't know about you, but I always just imagine it's a flat field. And that you've got a line of Philistines and a line of Israelites. And they're just looking at each other saying, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go first. No, you go paper, rock, scissors, you know, for it. That's the way that I always imagined it. But it's not that way. It's, it, it, it's these, what we have to remind ourselves of is these were military powerhouses. And they weren't just willy-nilly going to war here. They had a strategy. And they absolutely were not going to give up their position and give up this and so they were in this deadlock. Now, war is very expensive. And it's expensive today. And unfortunately, we, we continue to see that in so many places. But here in this day and time, it was really expensive. Those soldiers had to get food. Supplies had to be taken to the camp. This was something that, that really took a toll on a nation's resources. And so what would happen in the case of this deadlock... It's so that more people would not die because of starvation or more, more resources would not be used than needed to be used. What would happen is they would choose and nominate, each side would choose and nominate a champion, a person to go and meet and battle for the sake of their country. And so that's where we get Goliath. And so we, we can read it here in, in 1 Samuel. It says, Then a champion came out from the camp of the Philistines named Goliath of Gath. Now when he came out, it was not a surprise to the Israelites. This was a part of war. This is what happened. This was supposed to be what happened. Two countries are in a deadlock, so they send a representative out. So the Philistines say, okay, Goliath, you head on out there. So Goliath comes out. 
Now his height was six cubits and a span, so they say he's anywhere between this much taller than me and that much taller than me, but he's quite tall. And, his, and he had a bronze helmet on his head. He wore a coat of scale armor, which is overlapping metal plates, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. This guy is, is decked out. Now it says here that he was a champion. So the word for champion that's used in the scripture literally means this. The Hebrew refers to the one who fights alone, single-handedly representing his nation. If warring nations agree to the contest, a great deal of bloodshed can be avoided. Goliath was a personal, solo fighting warrior. If anyone knows anything about baseball, uh, a lot of times on a pitching staff they'll have what's called a closer. This is a guy brought in to end the game. And Goliath is a professional champion. He's a professional closer. The whole purpose that he exists for his army is to walk solo out on that battlefield and take another man's life. That's Goliath. So if we, if we continue looking at the rest of the story here, Goliath, as the Bible is just going down from head to toe on him, He's got shin protectors on his legs. He's got a bronze javelin that hung between his shoulders. The wooden shaft of this spear was like a weaver's beam. The blade head of the spear weighed 600 shekels of of iron, which is about like uh, 20 kg. And a shield bearer walked in front of him. The shield that he was carrying was, was the height of Goliath. So everywhere Goliath went, the shield bearer walked in front of him and carried the shield in front of him. This guy is a walking warhouse. Now it goes on in the next verse, and Goliath stood and shouted to the battle lines of Israel, saying to them, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? And am I not the Philistine? Are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and have him come down to me. So Goliath is saying, You're not playing by the rules. I'm here. Am I not representing the Philistines? Hey, Israel, where's your guy? I'm just you got to send somebody down. This is the way that this works. And then in verse 9, he goes on to say, if, if he is able to fight with me and kill me, so Goliath is basically saying, here's the terms and conditions of this fight. We're at a deadlock. I've come down. I'm, I'm, I'm ready to take on your challenger that you send to me. And here's the terms. Here's how this is going to go. If he's able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. So therefore, all the Philistines would serve the Israelites. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. Again, the Philistines said, I defy the battle lands of Israel this day. So he is on the battlefield. Give me a man so that we may fight together. If you think about this scene... This open field in this valley. And Goliath shouting these words to an army of Israel. Saying, give me a man. Come on. Give me somebody to fight. I'm ready. So, Israel has got to make a choice to send somebody down. You've got Goliath the giant. But who is Israel's giant? Who is that going to be? Now, this actually blew my mind when I I read this and when I looked at this. Israel, turns out, did have a giant. They had an actual, real giant. And we can see this here in in the text. it's, It's kind of hidden for us. But their giant was Saul. Saul was their king. King Saul. What does the Bible say about King Saul? He was taller than any of the people from his shoulders upwards. So if you took the average height of an Israelite and you then added a shoulder and a head height on top of that, Saul was almost just about as tall as Goliath. Israel had a giant. It was Saul. King Saul was a giant. He was the one that was worthy to face Goliath, giant against giant. So the people looked at Saul. Saul, you are the giant. You're the one that's supposed to face Goliath. And then it, it, uh, First Samuel here it goes on, he's, he's describing Saul. And he says to all the people, do you see him whom the Lord has chosen? For there is no one among him, no one like him, among all the people. So the people shouted and said, long live the king. See, Saul was a giant like Goliath. He was unlike anyone else in the kingdom of Israel. So if Saul is like that, 
Then where is Israel's giant? Where was he? Where was the giant of Israel? Well, in, in verse 11, and this is, this is sad. Saul, who's head and shoulders above everyone else, who is the giant appointed by God when Israel asked for a king, who's the only one that can stand nose to nose, eye to eye, up to Goliath, when Saul heard these words of the Philistine, of Goliath, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. See, Saul hid. He hid in his tent and he wouldn't leave. And for 40 days, Goliath taunted the, the nation of Israel. He stood on that field and he yelled at them day after day after day, saying, give me an opponent. And Israel was too afraid to go, but it's because King Saul, their own Goliath, was too afraid to go out onto the battlefield. Now, the next person that enters into the story is, is the guy that we all know. This is the guy that we would all choose to identify with. And this is King David. So I say King David because beforehand, Samuel had already been to David's house. Uh, his dad was Jesse. And Samuel had already blessed him that he would be the next king of Israel. And David's like, wow, that's amazing. I don't really know how to take that. And David, even after Samuel kind of blesses him and anoints him, David goes out to, to be the shepherd. So David's official title, as of right now, is King David, who's not, he's not yet king yet, shepherd and bringer of lunch. So David was in charge of all this, of the sheep, his dad's sheep, but David had another job. David's job was to take lunch to his brothers on the front line. See, war divides families today, and it divided families then. You had Jesse, the dad. He had these four sons. Three of them were on the battle lines. David... The small one, the shepherd boy, the one that spent all his time out in the wild taking care of the sheep. David goes and he's assigned this, this title of dignity and honor, bringer of lunch. And so David goes out and he brings lunch to his brothers. And when he gets to the, the fighting line, when he gets to his brothers, he hears Goliath and he says, wait a minute, what is this guy saying? David has a problem with it. David says, we serve God. This isn't right. Goliath can't stand there and insult God. We have to stand up to this guy. And so some people hear David talking about that. And actually one of his brothers says, what the heck are you doing here? Why don't you go tend the few sheep that you tend? So he's like saying, you're insignificant. Even what you do for, your, for, for our father is insignificant. Why are you here? We like to think that David's got, you know, he's got a bit of a spicy personality and he likes to do what I like to do, which is, is poke the bear, as I call it, kind of rile people up. And David keeps talking and eventually he makes his way all the way to Saul. King Saul hears about this and Saul says, this is amazing. Somebody else can go and fight Goliath. David walks in and Saul says, this is not amazing. You are the wrong person. And so David does what any of us would do at a job interview. David hands in his CV. And David's CV had three main points on it. <laughs> dead lion, dead bear, mighty God. David literally tells Saul that I as a shepherd boy went and I have with my bare hands chased down a lion and a bear and pulled my sheep out of its mouth and killed, struck them both down. So David is a lion killer. He is a bear killer. David may be a little shepherd boy, but he comes with, with a mighty CV behind him. And then on top of that, David serves a mighty God. David says, I serve a mighty God. This mighty God is strong enough to conquer Goliath. And so if we look at 1 Samuel 17, 40, we kind of pick up. David, he, he takes his shepherd's staff in his hand and he chooses for himself these five stones. See what had happened before this is Saul had tried to put his armor on David. And Saul's like, well, <laughs> all right, buddy. <laughs> if you say so, you can head on out there. Uh, we should probably give him some armor, which will just slow down the process of Goliath chewing him up, you know. And so, so they put the armor on him, and David says, I'm not really used to this. And see, this is when a, a, real, like a good preacher would say, hey, whose armor are you wearing? Are you wearing somebody else's armor? No, you need to walk with confidence in God and not put on somebody else's armor, right? <laughs> whose armor are you wearing? Take the armor off. <laughs> you know, some of you guys are walking around carrying a legacy you shouldn't carry on your show. Yeah, so that's, see, that's the narrative. That feels good. 
We could do that. We could go that way. But that is not necessarily why the Israelites wrote this story down. And so David, he takes his staff, his shepherd's staff, and he goes down to and, and he chooses five stones out of the stream bed. He put them in his shepherd's bag, which he had. That is in his shepherd's pouch. So David's prepared. And he takes this sling in his hand and he approached the Philistine. So let me show you David's actual footpath. You have the Israelites camped up on a hill. This is the stream that David would have walked across to get to the battle area. I just, what was it like to be David and to walk down this hill? I mean, is he thinking, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip, don't trip. People are watching. <laughs> left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot, left foot, right foot. You know? Or is he humming a tune? Or is he surrendering his soul to God? I don't know what's going through David's mind. But he pauses here. He picks five stones. Walks out onto the battlefield. Now, see, David, he, he had a sling. And when we think about the story, we think about, you know, this thing. This is what I use at home to get the birds off the roof. You take this kind of sling. But what David actually had was, was a leather thong. It was this leather strap. And it had a, a, a wider part in the middle. And he would load a stone in it. And he would, he would spin it around. And then he would release it in a certain way. And because he was a shepherd, because he was used to fending off his sheep, and because he was a boy bored out in the wild, he probably was really, really good at this thing. And they say that, that someone that was good and accurate with this thing, that when they released that stone, it would come out with the same power that a forty-five caliber bullet comes out of a gun. See, David, David with his little sling, was not a little boy with a slingshot. David was a man confident in God with a powerful weapon that God had used to develop in him over time. So David picks up his five stones. He walks out into the battlefield and he knows he's got his one shot to do this. And so I want to read you guys the story of David and Goliath's first encounter. And it, it's got a, a little bit of scripture here. They're going to put this up for you in 1 Samuel 17, 41 through 47. And I want to read it to you kind of un, unbroken. And so I'm going to read here and, and they'll follow along. So the Philistine came and he approached David. He approached him with his shield bearer in front of him. And when the Philistine looked around and saw David, he derided and disparaged him because he was just a young man with a ruddy complexion and a handsome appearance. David was good looking. This is why I, I think this is about me. This reflects me. You know, this is, this is why we put ourselves in David's position. Because he's, you know, a ruddy experience. And yeah, that's what I tell myself. You got to do what you got to do, right? You get up every morning, you look in the mirror, you got to make a decision. Who am I today? Well, you know what? I'm going to be this. So in verse 43, the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you came to me with a shepherd's staff? And the Philistine cursed David by his God. So, so Goliath is frustrated because he's like, I'm just going to destroy you. What is it that your army thinks that I am? A dog? You with a boy with a staff? Come on now. And the Philistine, he says to David in verse 44, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. That's a strong, that's a strong statement. And then in verse 45, David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and a spear and a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. See, Goliath pointed out his weapons, and David says, I see your weapons, and here's my weapon. My weapon is the mighty God that I come to you. So guess what? We're about to go to battle here. You've got your weapons. I've got my weapon. My weapon is God Almighty. And so then in, in verse 46, David goes on to say, This day the Lord will hand you over to me. I will strike you down and cut off your head. I will give the corpses of your army, of the Philistine army this day, to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, so that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then in verse 47, And this entire assembly, everyone here may know the Lord, does not save with the sword or the spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and He will hand you over to us. Those are strong words by David. And now that we know what happens, the, the, the giant Goliath takes off running towards David. And David loads a rock. 
and he winds up his sling, and wow, he throws it like a gunshot. That leather whips, and you hear a gunshot go off in the air, and Goliath falls. David had hit him right in the head. David immediately runs over to him and takes his own sword and cuts this guy's head off. He cuts it off, he holds it in the air. This battle is done, this war is done. David is victorious. See, David's weapon was a mighty God. And David was victorious. And then what happened after that is the Israelites all rushed down the hill because Goliath has been defeated. And they ended up chasing the Philistine army, slaying them and and killing them as they caught them. And then what David said was true. That evening, just like a battlefield, you know, and and I don't mean to be graphic here, but it is in the Bible, the birds actually came down and picked off of the dead bodies. So what David said happened. David is victorious. So now this leads us to ask the question again. Why was this written? Why were the Isra- or what were the Israelites trying to preserve when they wrote for this? When they wrote this for us? And it, why? It could have been handed down orally, but instead they wrote it down. See, Israel knew that they had something unique here. Israel had a giant problem, but the problem wasn't a giant. See, the problem was something else. The problem wasn't Goliath as a giant. The problem wasn't David as a boy. See, this story, it's not a tale about a giant or a boy. This is actually a story that is a tale of two kings. See, there was a time when God ruled over Israel. And Israel looked, and all the nations around them had kings. And Israel said, well, I want a king. Where's God, why don't we have a king? And so God said, you don't need a king, I'm your God. And then you know, the nation of Israel said, yes, give us a king. Otherwise, people won't respect us. People won't uh, uh, treat us like, like the, the people that we should be treated as. We need a king. And so Israel gave, uh, or, or God gave Israel, King Saul. So the tale of two kings here is the king that they were supposed to want, which was God, and the king that God gave them because they were bickering, which is Saul. And so Israel went from Israel once served a God. They asked for a king. God gave them their own king, and he was a giant just like Goliath. But Saul hid. Now here's something that's really important that, that, that adds even more meaning to this story. So when someone looked to a king or a leader of a nation, the character or the behavior of the leader reflected the character of their God. So, this was well known, well accepted. So when people looked at Saul hiding, then that meant that Israel was, being, was worshiping and serving a God that was afraid, a God that was scared, a God that would hide when trouble came its way. And, and that was who people saw when Saul was hiding. But if we compare the character of Saul and the character of David, see, see this, is, this is where we really get into why did they write this down? Because you have Saul who was hiding, which represents a God that hides when you get into trouble. And then you have David, and his character was the opposite of that. His character was, I believe in this mighty God. I'm going to charge the battlefield. I'm going to take this fight. I'm going to fight this fight. And I'm going to do it in the name of God. In fact, I don't have weapons. I'm not even claiming weapons. Sword, javelin, spear, armor, none of it. All I have is the power of a mighty God that is behind me. And when David does that, the character of David then reflects the God that we serve today. This reflects God as who he is. And so... David would then go on to pave the way for this guy named Jesus. Jesus came from the line of David. David represented what Jesus would do for us. Jesus would come to the front line of our battle and he would save us. He would give his life for us. He's not going to hide like Saul. He's going to charge the battle like David. So, I I think part of why Israel wrote this story down is because they wanted to make sure that we asked this question over and over and over again and give us the opportunity to ask the question of, do you serve a Saul or are you saved by a David? that's, That's something for you to work out within yourself. Are you serving 
a giant, a good-looking king? Or are you saved by David, who represents Jesus, a guy that goes to the front line for you? See, unlike Saul, and we can gain this from David, God doesn't leave the fight up to you. God is in the fight for you. And so I, I believe that Israel wrote this down for us. Because Israel wanted to preserve the idea, preserve the fact that it would never be a king that would bring them to, to victory. It would never be a king that would set them free. It would never be a king that they should serve. It should always be God. It should always be God. See, David and Goliath is a, is a story about Jesus being our overcomer. It was just told all those years ago. See, Israel's overcomer was God. It wasn't a king. And so they wrote this down. So the question here, this is where we jump back into the metaphors a little bit. Where we take a little bit of liberty on what this means or what this is saying to us. Is this, what is the true Goliath? What is that true Goliath? Is it your work, your job? Is it all the cliches that we can think of? No. Those are just hard times. Those are just tough things that you deal with in your day. The true Goliath that we're up against is sin and death. That's our true Goliath. And thank the Lord that we don't have to serve a Saul, but we can be saved by a Jesus, by what we saw in David. See, Jesus came, and he conquered, and he overcame sin and death. And he declared that Goliath in our life was defeated. Josh, put that on the screen for us. Let's say that again. Jesus came and conquered sin and overcame death. He defeated our Goliath. So what that means for you is this. What that means is that when, when you are struggling with the sin of addiction, it's already been conquered for you. When you are struggling with fear, it's already been conquered for you because there's a Jesus that rushed the front line of your battle and He's in the fight with you. If you're struggling with anxiety, it's already been conquered for you. If you're struggling with depression, it's already been conquered for you. If you're struggling with, with uncertainty in your life, if you're struggling with self-worth, if you're struggling with, with sin, if you're struggling with a, a, just a hopeless marriage or a hopeless situation, then you need to know that that Goliath, the sin and the death, has already been defeated. That battle has already been won for you because Jesus came and He followed in David's footsteps and He rushed our battle line and He conquered sin and death in your life. And that's why Israel wrote this story down. Because they wanted us to know that sin and death is conquered. There is no Goliath that, that can take your life. Because your life is already fought for and it's already won on the battlefield. See, when David conquered Goliath, the whole rest of the Israelite army rushed behind him. And when God goes out and conquers your sin and conquers your death, then you can confidently rush behind God. And take what's yours and take the land that God has promised you. And so I, I want to, as we end here, I, I want you to pray a prayer. I want you to think about something spe very, very specific. And that's, that's, do you have a Goliath in your life? And what I mean by that is not a hard time or a tough experience. But do you have a sin or a death? Something you feel like, man, I totally... I messed this relationship up. This relationship is now dead. Because sin in my life, my ego, or whatever it is, has conquered that, has, has just killed this relationship. But do you have a sin in your life? Do you have a death in your life? Do you have unconquered land in your life that is a Goliath yelling at you, give me all you got because I'm going to conquer it. You're never going to be free. You're never going to be able to, to, to have your own land. I am always going to be here. And I'm always going to remind you that I will defeat you over and over and over and over again. So just go and hide in your tent. If that's you, then you have such an easy thing to do. You just claim that Jesus has conquered your sin. He's conquered death. And so that Goliath in you is already dead. 
That Goliath in you is already put to death because Jesus paved the way. And so I want us to all bow our heads. I'm going to lead us in a prayer. And then the band is going to come out and and sing. And we've got our our prayer partners that will come down on the sides to pray for you or pray with you. And I really would encourage you to to, uh, come down and just pray with them. Anyone can come down for prayer. It it doesn't mean there's something wrong with you or or you're broken. It just means that we want to journey with you. So with your head down and uh, and your eyes closed, I just want to say this. Um, I want you to have a little bit of courage this morning. And I want you to have a little bit of boldness this morning, knowing that you have Jesus behind you. And, and I want to say an extra prayer for you. So if, if, you have, um, if you have unconquered land in your heart that, that you feel like a Goliath has been telling you you can never have, it's just going to beat you over and over and over again. If you want a King David, a Jesus, to come and conquer a Goliath that you've not been able to conquer up till now, I just want you to slip your hand up in the air because I'm going to pray for you. Three, two, one, hands up. Okay, you can put your hands down. Just by raising your hand, you've opened a doorway for Jesus to rush forward and conquer the Goliath in your life. So I'm going to pray for us. Lord, Heavenly Father, we pray for all the hands that were raised and we pray, Lord, that that all the...